Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O'Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here and happy new year. If you celebrate such things at this time, I'm a spring equinox, equinox, new year kind of guy myself, but hey, whatever works for you. And hey, our guest this time around is Jeff Nixa. He's a shamanic practitioner, teacher, and author of the book, The Lost Art of Heart Navigation, a modern shaman's field manual. Jeff founded the Great Plains Shamanic Programs back in 2010. Those are an array of counseling, healing, and education services, including one-on-one fire talks, seminars, university classes, outdoor retreats, and wilderness trips. And in this chat, Jeff and I are going to dig a bit into what is known as the heart path and that lost art of heart navigation. Basically, that's taking wisdom from ancient shamanic traditions and using it to teach ourselves how to follow our hearts so we live a more satisfying and more fulfilling life. And despite what I just said about my personal New Year celebration, I think it's a great chat for this time of year when many of us are looking to make some changes in our lives. And it's a great companion to that last episode of 2018 about the forgotten art of love. Now, I was under the weather a bit when we recorded this. I think I had some of what Jeff calls hurry sickness, just working myself silly into a state of dis-ease. Regardless, this conversation is... Well, it's fucking poetry on tape, I think. Yeah, I said tape. I'm an analog dude, and I'm not the least bit ashamed of it. Anyway, I do hope you enjoy this chat, and I hope you get on the Patreon to hear the extension, because it's well worth it. Jeff Nixa is in the house to get us on the heart path right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Jeff Nixa, welcome to the show, man. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Ryan. I'm looking forward to our time together this evening. Absolutely. You and me both. So, you know, Jeff, you have a a varied academic and professional background that has curiously led you to where you are now as a full-time shamanic practitioner. Tell us a bit about that background and what led you down what we will come to know over the next hour or two as the heart path. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> every time I do these interviews, I have to uh, be careful to just try to be precise and brief because this is a long story. So I'll do my best here. But uh, I'm an ordinary guy. Okay, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. My father was a uh, accountant. My mom was a nurse. I didn't have any background in the shamanic stuff. We were a Roman Catholic family and uh, grew up. Went to college and didn't know what I wanted to do after college and wound up going to law school in Portland, Oregon which is a fine profession, except it wasn't for me. And I knew that almost instantly. I'd gone all the way across the country, you know, taken the entrance exams and paid the fees and moved and quit my job. And and I just had this feeling in my gut, like within hours, if not days, uh, in those first classes, the first week of law school, that this was just not what I thought it was going to be. And I was like, oh, my God, 
because I, you know, invested so much and and I didn't know what to do because it wasn't like there was something else that I really wanted to do. I had no clarity on on who I was, and we'll talk more about that. But basically, I wrote a whole book and got into this whole shamanic healing work because it, it it's what I wish I would have had back then, which was some kind of reliable, safe, trustworthy, unmediated spiritual guidance. In other words, something I could plug into myself to kind of help me figure out what to do with my life, you know, the big questions, purpose and vocation and all that, but also the day-to-day decisions, relationships, what job to do or to not do and and so forth. So I was drawn into this this shamanic work, not because I woke up one morning and decided, uh, hey, I want to be a shamanic healer. I didn't even frankly know what that was, as I say in my book at the beginning. But there were aspects of it that just instantly rang true for me, which was what I was missing all the years prior. For example, a deep connection with nature. I just have a great fondness for nature, as a lot of your listeners do. But more than just, you know, liking sunsets and pretty butterflies and, you know, rainbows. It's like a deep connection. I have always felt with that, even as a boy. Uh, some of my favorite memories are being alone out in nature. I was never afraid of nature. And growing up, you know, I did things like Boy Scouts, which got me comfortable out in the wilderness and not assuming that nature was out to get me or hurt me, which I've learned that a lot of adults today really struggle with. So I had kind of an orientation, a nature-based orientation, just, I guess, kind of as part of my character or my own nature. And I had a strong religious background. You know, I understood the importance of religious community and having some kind of, you know, authority figure. So you're not just thinking you're, you know, all things all the time. And, uh, but it, 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 I kind of grew out of it. There's nothing against the religion of my family. It just, after a while, it felt uh, like it was not, not working for me. And that too, wasn't a big decision. Um, it was just kind of like, getting everything I could out of this tradition and still being hungry for more, uh, specifically around these deeper issues of, of identity, self-identity, and being able to navigate in this uh, difficult life and world we live in. Fast forward, I was working uh, in healthcare for many years. I got out of law and uh, found a pretty good match for my interest in uh, as a professional hospital chaplain, obviously a, a religious slash spiritual role. And I really enjoyed that for many years. But again, kind of like I was in the right ballpark, but not quite on the beam or in the right groove for me personally. And I even always felt kind of felt uncomfortable with the religious role. I didn't really like that. It, was, it wasn't important for me for people to see me as, you know, some kind of minister or something special. I, I didn't, I don't see myself as that. And still, it did not have really, frankly, much to do with nature, the traditional Judeo Christian popular religion is is really kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, dissociated in a way from nature. It's certainly in the sacred texts and in the stories of Jesus and Old Testament. But in day-to-day practice, you can be a good Christian and not really care about the earth, was my experience. In other words, uh, I never heard a sermon once in my entire growing up on nature or our duty to steward the earth, as opposed to our duty to take care of fellow human beings and, you know, mind our own manners. And I know that's not an intentional thing in the part of the tradition, but it's just another example of how, for me personally, there was always something missing having to do with our relationship with all living things. One day, a client of mine, I I, I got into massage therapy at one point, was a professional massage therapist in healthcare hospitals and had my own practice. And One day, a client was getting off of my massage table and uh, for the weekend. And I said, you know, just making conversations. I said, so what are you doing this weekend? And she said, I'm going to go up to Dwajak, Michigan and meet with a shamanic healer, a shaman. And there was this silence on my part. I'm like, a shaman? You mean like a medicine man? And she's like, yeah, kind of. He's a psychotherapist professionally, but he's a, a man with a Cherokee. Native American background, and he's integrated those two things. And man, that's all I remember her saying, because there was something about that that just woke something up in me. And I'm like, man, I got to call this guy, whoever he is. Didn't even know why. I called him up. His name is uh, Michael Smith. Uh, he's, a, he's a world-renowned 
shamanic practitioner and Jung scholar, Carl Jung. Michael is an academic and a clinical psychologist. Uh, he was leading a traditional vision quest ceremony that very summer, a couple months from when I met with him. And I sat down and met with him uh, in his little woodsy property, in this little cabin out in the woods. And in the process of that conversation, he turned to me and I had told him all about my struggles with everything, spirituality and vocation and yada, yada. And he said, you might want to consider a vision quest. And again, it was like, okay, <laughs> I'd heard about these. I didn't know a lot about them, but that's all I needed to hear. And I did it. Uh, vision quest is uh, from two to four days of uh, solo time in the wilderness. It's a time of fasting and prayer and, and, and crying out for a vision comes from uh, many indigenous traditions. It is a week-long structure. You start with a group of people who are also going through the same process, a lot of introductory stuff and ceremony and getting people ready, and then we headed out. And at the end of that time, that solo time, I was alone on a beach in, um, on an island in northern Lake Michigan. And the sun was setting, and just as the sun, just as the red ball of the sun touched the horizon of the water out there in the west, this vision came to me, and it was very simple. It was one word, <laughs> but uh, if you imagine someone tapping the side of a crystal glass with a, a knife, you know, like at a wedding ceremony to get people's attention, it was like, ding. And the word that came to me was simplify. Simplify. It wasn't a word that I heard audibly, but it was a deeply felt sense that of all the shit I was struggling with, cluttered life, multiple jobs, a mother who was struggling with uh, Parkinson's disease and a lot of stuff I was doing. I was a president of a volunteer bicycle advocacy coalition in our region. I was doing too much and I couldn't see it. And the vision was simplified. And I, I understood it instantly. And again, fast forwarding, I kind of came back from that week just on fire to drop unnecessary commitments in my life in a, in a healing way. You know, and so I got home and I got on my computer and I started sending emails out like crazy, resigning from this committee, resigning from that program. And I pared my life down in a matter of hours to the core need, of course, to attend to my mother and then my one key job at the time in healthcare. And uh, man, that changed everything because that experience out there and realizing how I somehow needed that kind of nature based immersion. And we would say an initiation experience traditional initiation of soul, to be able to see what was kind of in my face all along, but I had too many layers of distraction and busyness and hurry sickness like our whole culture does. And uh, this, this gentleman, Michael Smith, was, turns out, I didn't know it at the time, but he was leading an ongoing shamanic apprenticeship program. And I jumped into that, involved a series of weekend trainings and workshops and things over a period of years. And uh, I did more training and more Wilderness programs eventually ended up assisting him. Also studied with Sandra Angerman. And, and I probably said plenty to answer your question, but the point is it was kind of I backed into this work, but it all felt right and it was all kind of nicely uh guided, you know, like I was being supported throughout this. And and now I'm just trying to share this uh medicine, as I call it, with others. Definitely. Yeah, it's a great intro to you and to the themes that are gonna be pervasive throughout our chat here and you know i was really drawn to the work for i think probably the same reason or i guess the same feeling that you had when you just sort of maybe felt lost about what it is you're meant to do and i feel like i'm going through that same thing so i don't know i guess i was just i guess your book just called to me in some weird way and and that's why we're here now so and you know there was one phrase up front that i really liked that you used in the beginning of the book and it was as the author of this field manual I don't want you to just learn something about shamanism. I want you to do something with your life. And I think that that sets apart this book from a lot of other books like it or a lot of other, you know, how-to books about any sort of occult or esoteric topic. You see a lot of these introductory texts to, to magic and, you know, it's, I don't really get the, the impression that people care about how I use it, but I really got it. Well, I guess I have to, you know, I'm going to use a little cliche here. Got a real heartfelt sort of vibe from your words here. And I just wanted to thank you for that up front here, just so you know that, you know, that really resonated with me, man. Oh, thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate you catching that because I, this work, I'll just kind of get on the soapbox just for a moment. In my 
study over the years and my work with other people who are drawn to this work and seeing how other people practice. And this kind of work draws out a really funky array of people, of course, because it's not exactly a regulated profession, you know, like medicine or, or ministry work or something. It's anybody can do this. And there are great benefits to that in terms of freedom and not having to have, you know, university degree. And there's great limitations with that. I've met people who are out there claiming to do healing work. And frankly, they need to be in psychotherapy themselves. They need to be back on their meds. You know, they're telling people that they're hearing things and know what that person should do for their life. And they're quick to give advice. And, and that can get dangerous in terms of creating unhelpful dependencies on the practitioner, i.e. on the shamanic practitioner. And, and people can get really, really out there, you know, like can kind of get disembodied and leave this world, so to speak, and all the predictions, you know, all the what speculation about things like the quantum universe and fractile consciousness and the infinite consciousness. And as you kind of hinted at extraterrestrial life on other planets and past life regressions, all of this is, you know, can be heard and it breaks during conversations in these training sessions and all that's great. And I'm not saying any of that is not out there, but it doesn't help us be present in this body, in this wounded world right now. Our planet's really suffering and our people are suffering. And it's almost like people are finding an escapist route through some of these more esoteric practices that I just don't think is part of their original intent. The original intent was to help heal people, integrate their lives enhance their relationships right now in the so-called tribe that they're in and not, you know, send them off on speculations about what might happen in the future or another solar system. So it's a balance. I mean, there's certainly things we do called shamanic journeys. It can sound kind of funky. They're very powerful and they can be very helpful. But the practitioner has to be grounded themselves personally. So I think a good program, if any of your listeners are interested, will be a program that focuses strongly on making sure the individual themselves has worked through their shit, so to speak, has has done their own initiation work. And all my good teachers have emphasized that, that, you know, we have no business going out there claiming to be healers until we have healed ourselves first. And I believe that's part of the Hippocratic Oath, you know, like physician heal thyself is a theme. So thank you anyways. I, I do want people to do something with their life and not just learn some cool new things about ancient traditions, you know, and I mean, who cares at this point in what's going on in our world? We need power filled people with clear visions in their life and how they're going to, as I said, heal themselves, but also work in their community and ultimately do something for our planet and nature. And that's a whole different ball game that requires warriors, you know, people who, who are willing to make real sacrifices and um, live a particular way. Walk a good path, as my Lakota friends might say. Absolutely, man. I uh, I feel that disconnect, man, between myself and nature too. Especially this time of year when you know, mm, you're, yeah. you're stuck indoors more and you can't see the sun as much. It's just depressing yeah. on some level. But once I woke up to that, that I was disconnected from those things. I've have made it a a priority in my life to go outside more and just just sit. Like I don't have to do anything. You know, I just go and I just sit and I just. <laughs> Kind of just yes. absorb the environment around me, you know? It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, thanks, yeah. I mean, that's actually about a third of my book, what I guess I would call the more innovative part, where it's not just me trying to collect solid teachings that I've learned along the way from others, but there's a real focus on mindfulness in the present moment, the importance of being grounded in actual nature. And a little aside there, there's a, a phrase I heard in my training called hotel shamanism. And what that refers to is, you know, you can find shamanic healing courses in any big city, workshops, weekend retreats, and so on. And a lot of these take place in, you know, like conference center settings, whether it's a beautiful retreat center or some hotel in the downtown inner city or big city. And it's all fine, except you can go through an entire training program and never actually set foot out in nature. It's kind of bizarre. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. I think innocently and unconsciously, the, those teachers are replicating the problem, you know, teaching people the importance of getting in touch with nature spirits and never actually getting out in nature just seems kind of odd to me. So in my programs, I've tried hard to always have some, <laughs> even if I am in an urban setting, get people out in the parking lot, at least, you know, in the fresh air and the sunshine or the rain or the snow or the wind. It's all can all teach us. 
Absolutely, man. And, you know, let's get into some of that shamanic psychology. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Michael Smith earlier. He actually wrote the forward to your book. He had a good quote up here that said, the shamanic heart psychology teaches us that the intellect has no idea what we are here for or what we really want. And then later on, you say that there are two paths that we follow. The mind, you know, the path of the intellect, and the heart path. And the difference between the two, I think, is probably fairly obvious if you think about it. But give folks a, a brief, you know, sort of Cliff Notes version of how these two paths really differ from each other. Yeah, thanks. So we live in a highly rationalistic society. And it's kind of heartening, actually. There's a lot more sort of popular conversation about this whole thing you just asked about in modern media. And so I think your listeners will know basically what we're talking about here. But We are immersed, we are embedded, you and I, in American Western dominant consciousness, which we don't think about as just there. But what that consciousness is, it's it's a heavy preference and orientation toward using our intellect to solve our life problems, right? So if I'm in college and I don't know what to do with my life, our culture says, well, here's what you do. I mean, be logical about it. Do some research. Find out what careers are out there, which ones pay the most, where there's the most jobs, which have the best 401k retirement plans, the best opportunities for travel, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like a rationalistic, just sort of go find out there the best lineup of goodies that you can get for your life that, you know, of course, would use your particular talents, but that's actually not a big emphasis in my humble opinion. And so this is how we lead our lives. This is how we find a partner on the internet sometimes trying to, you know, match all the attributes with the attributes we're seeking. And it always ends in frustration and a sense of unsatisfying results because nothing about this approach connects with our authentic inner core self, which goes by many names, our soul, our heart, our core of aliveness. Our center, capital C, center, doesn't matter what we call it, but it's that sacred spiritual part of ourselves that even religious people often know nothing about, having participated their entire lives in communal ceremonies and worship and Bible studies and reading sacred books. But no one has ever helped them sit down and go, hey, here's your particular manifestation of the sacred, whether you call it Christ consciousness or Buddha consciousness, or spirit in a shamanic sense. So what happens is we're trying to navigate our life kind of like with our eyes closed. Or, I don't know, I'm going to reach into the airline industry for a metaphor here, but it's kind of like always flying your aircraft on instrumentation mode as opposed to visual seat of your pants, what's actually outside the window mode. And, you know, from time to time, highly technological aircraft fly right into the side of mountains, <laughs> not for lack of technology or smart people behind the aircraft. It was a lack of common sense, a lack of actually looking out the window and seeing what, what's going on. And so the shamanic work for me was like that. It's not about minimizing or disregarding the mind. It's not about being illogical. The mind is a powerful tool we have. But it's only half of the capacities that any given human has for surviving. I kind of refer to in the book as our animal sense, our instinctual sense. And that, too, is many ways to talk about this. Our feminine spirit, our more intuitive sense, our wildness. You know, there's a part of us that knows exactly what to do if we're stuck out in a dark, spooky place. But we don't know about that place that can come alive. And how would we know unless you do something like a vision quest or you've been in some kind of outward bound program or you've truly had to see what happens <laughs> when you run out of food or your fire goes out and you don't just die. Things come up, things awaken in you, senses and awarenesses. And uh, um, it's hard to explain in a short period of time, but this is the heart. The heart knows what to do. So just like you would recognize maybe someone that you instantly have a connection with across a room without a word, catch someone's eye at a party and you're like, oh my God, (laughs) I need to go talk to that person. It's that kind of, which has nothing to do with the intellect, right? That's what Michael was referring to. And I remember one time in one of our shamanic apprenticeships, he was talking about this. He says, you know, the mind is powerful, but you can basically shut that thing off when you're doing this (laughs) 
kind of work. And, and he meant an actual formal healing ceremony. He didn't mean, <laughs> you know, living your life or, or running a practice, but trying to make the point that the intellect is powerful. We need it. But there are times when it is simply gets in the way. And any good psychotherapist or Jungian scholar or person in the healing profession knows how, how we can completely self-sabotage our happiness by how we think about things, our limited perceptions, our judgments about ourselves and others and so on. And, and so I think in a roundabout way, that's my attempt to describe this difference between navigating by your intellect, by reason, kind of like the inner Spock, you know, like in Star Trek. Here's a beautiful metaphor for the, the for human reason run a little bit amok. And Captain Kirk, I think, was a beautiful metaphor for the human heart, who he was a smart guy, but he knew when to kind of go off the map when, you know, everything was at stake and the Starship Enterprise was being attacked and none of the nothing was working. And he would always come up with some clever outside of the box way to solve things in conjunction with Spock. But Spock didn't get to be captain. And I think that was a beautiful show in that sense of those two guys had to work together, but Kirk had to be running the show. And so in our lives, the heart has to be out front. We can't let the mind navigate for us. The mind is there to help us um, make things so, as the helmsman on the Enterprise would often say, you know, make it so. So it's about balance between the heart and the mind. And our culture basically minimizes or dismisses the power and the capacities of the human heart. And shamanic work basically brings those alive and puts those front and center in a practical way where we can learn the skill of navigating by that capacity in us safely and uh, responsibly. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of breadcrumbs in there that could lead us down many different conversational paths, and <laughs> we'll, we'll try to get yeah. to as much as we can. So the first thing I want to ask then is, I actually want to back up for a moment, you know, because I like to think of these things also from a historical perspective. And shaman and shamanism, to me, like these words have always been sort of tricky to define. Is there a a single overriding historical definition of these words, or has the meaning of these words evolved over time? Beautiful question. I kind of tackle that at the beginning of the book. That word gets thrown around a lot. The word shaman, and I, how would I know how to pronounce this, came from a Siberian indigenous tribe of people called the Tungzit people, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. The point is, it's not from Western culture, from a remote tribe. And to them, it was their own word, just referring to teacher or one who knows. It, it could be translated as one who sees or one who knows, kind of with a connotation, I think, of you know a spiritual person in the tribe. That word was co-opted by Western anthropologists and used as kind of a code word to describe the whole bundle of sticks or attributes that could be seen as common throughout very different indigenous cultures of their sacred practices and their so-called spiritual healer types. It's a little bit, if I may, like the word rabbi. We all know what that means, even if we're not Jewish. But it comes from a very specific culture. And for people in that culture, it had a very specific meaning of teacher, a teacher of matters of religion and spirit. And we didn't get anybody's permission to just take that word from the Jewish culture and start using it everywhere. Similarly, it's a little presumptuous for a person to wake up in the morning and say, I'm a rabbi. Listen to me now, right? I mean, that would be crazy. A rabbi would be someone in the Jewish tradition who was acknowledged by the community as an effective and trustworthy teacher, right? Like they had to earn it. They didn't just wake up one morning and print out some business cards and go, Rabbi Nixa. So I feel the same way about the term shaman. I'm very reluctant and hesitant to call myself a shaman. I never do that in public when I'm speaking. And it's not because it's not an important word, but, but that word has to come from somebody besides else for me. And I remember at one of my long workshops, one of my students said to me, you know, you have been so helpful. This program has been so helpful. You are a shaman. And that was beautiful. That was a little blessing. You know, that's the kind of way one earns that. Shamanism is similarly, <laughs> it's like kind of a moving blob of, it's a loose term that's come up with by anthropologists basically to describe 
spiritual practices and spiritual beliefs that are common or they believe are common among many divergent cultural traditions, whether it's Australian Aboriginals or Great Plains Indians like the Lakota or Toltec healers down in Mexico, Tungza people in Siberia. And it's crazy in one way to even try to, to make similar comments about this. Indigenous people get a little crazy when Westerners like you and I start calling ourselves shamanic people because we just, we just don't have that kind of culture in the modern world. And even the practices that we are calling common can be so different. For example, in the Plains tradition, to go on a so-called shamanic journey or connect with the spirit world, you often are beating a drum, a small hand drum, rhythmically. You've certainly seen that and your readers know about that. But if you go to Tibet or Mongolia, (laughs) a person's going to also maybe be beating on a small hand drum, but they're going to be dancing around and throwing yak milk around and shouting chants, and there may be dissection of animals to look at their organs. So quite a divergent process. And in South America, another example, often we'll be using plant medicine, psychogenic plant medicines like ayahuasca in the jungle to reach these states, not drumming, in other words. So each culture had its own way of entering the so-called spirit world to do the healing work and discern the information there. So it's a, it's a useful term just in a general sense, but it also has great limitations. And it's kind of the best we can do as Westerners to talk about these ancient and still existing, in some cases, spiritual traditions that are so deeply rooted in nature. Thanks for taking us through that. And I'm going to go back to the heart path now, connect back to that portion of the chat. What are the feeling tones of the heart and how do we better tune into them? Yeah, that's a term I got from my first teacher, Michael Smith. It's, it's a word to try to describe something that can't be seen or measured, you know, it's kind of like love, you know, like what, what's that? You know, you know it when you feel it, but go ahead and try to prove it to a scientist. Yeah, you know, I, I remember in my theology training and psychology training, I think the closest that psychology could get to defining the word love was something like sincere tokens of unconditional regard, unconditional positive regard. You know, it's like, (laughs) how clunky is that? Trying to describe what any normal person without too much education would call love. So the heart path and the heart tones, it's a similar challenge. It's there, it's real. We can lean on these things, but how do you define them? So I'll, I'll lead your listeners in just a very brief little exercise here to rather than try to explain this. These are our feelings, not simple emotions. They're deeply felt body connected feelings that help you know what you like and what you don't like, what you're attracted to and what you're repelled from. A little bit like if you were going to a restaurant and open a menu that had a whole array of cultural foods, right? And there'd be pizza, there'd be steak, there'd be pasta, there'd be Oriental food, there'd be Greek, you know, there'd be some African dishes, Lebanese. And let's say the descriptions all indicated that all these entrees had identical numbers of calories and fat and all that, so that intellectually, there was no difference. All these foods had similar, say, caloric and nutritional value. But of course, as you scanned through those items and thought about them or even saw them on a plate, you would have dramatically different feelings about which of those you actually wanted to taste and which of those you'd be like, no, not so much right now. And so the heart path and these feeling tones, it's similar to that, but it has to do with deeper issues. So here's a quick little exercise I teach my students. If you close your eyes, take a deep breath and just sort of clear out your mind from all this talking I'm doing, kind of go to a a blank screen. And then just imagine a person, a real person that you know, that you just love to be with, someone you love to be with. And imagine that you're in a grocery store, perhaps, and you see this person coming around down the aisle towards you and how you would feel. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're here. And imagine that person coming towards you and get clear on what you're feeling in your body. As you see that person who you just love to be with, maybe you haven't seen them for a long time. Maybe you have. The point is the connection that you feel, not an intellectual thing. And just for a moment here, as that person, you picture them in front of you clearly, like right there in front of you, notice their face, their smile, any little mannerisms they have, their aroma, they were perfume or cologne, what their hairstyle is like, their skin. Imagine them embracing you. 
And as you're doing this, get clear on what you're feeling inside your own body. And where are you feeling it? Is it in your chest, some kind of openness? Is it in your shoulders, just sort of relaxing? Is it a simple warmth that's not really anywhere, but it's everywhere in your body? Whatever that is, a sense of light, you know? So just enjoy that for a moment, having that person you just love to be with or would love to be with. And then a big exhale, big in-breath and blow that person completely out of your imagination. Go back to the blank screen, so to speak. And now I want you to imagine a person you can hardly stand to be in a room with, a real person who you know. Same thing. You're at the grocery store. Maybe you see them coming around the corner down the aisle toward you like, "Uh uh-oh. And imagine that person coming to you, maybe a person who's hurt you or is just, you know, you've got some history there. And as they get close to you and stop in front of you, you notice their face, their mannerisms, their aroma, what they're wearing and so on. And as you're doing this, notice what you're feeling in your body, your own body. What are you feeling? Where are you feeling it? And without judgment, this isn't a test or a judgment. It's just getting clear on your way of perceiving this person. Your way, nobody else's. Then take a deep breath in and blow the imagination of this person completely out of your consciousness and your imagination. (laughs) Shake your hands, shake it off. And just for fun, we'll leave you with that first person. So one more deep breath in. And imagine that first person, the real person that you love to be with, now back in front of you. <laughs> you might say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe who I just saw. And just again, for getting clarity on the feeling tones, what are you feeling and where in your body when you're with this person you love to be with? Now we could spend time going back and forth about who felt what, but when I do this exercise with people, everybody feels something. And it's all different. Some people feel tension in their chest with a person who's difficult or an openness with a person they love. Some people feel their shoulders hunch up or drop. Some people, it's not like a physical muscular thing. It's just an openness, a sense of openness in their chest or maybe their belly, their pelvis. And conversely, with a person who's difficult, there's a sense of tightness, closing down. Maybe their hands sweat a little bit or they clench their fists. Maybe their mind starts racing or they feel their breaths get shallower. The point is, this is a very simplistic, binary, but helpful exercise in getting a feel for the shift back and forth in the feeling tones of your soul. So with this person you love to be with and the person who's difficult to be with, you're not confused about that. Or if you are, your body's not. Because there's going to be a shift of some kind there. And shamanic work, as I've been trained, helps people get skillful in this being aware of what your body, i.e. your nature, your wildness, your animal self is doing moment by moment, especially in critical decision times or navigating, so to speak, such that you can use this as part of the process, say, of discerning what job to take, you know? It's a job in San Francisco, it's gonna pay me $100,000 a year, wahoo, you know, lots of travel. But when you check in with your body, maybe it's like, meh, I don't know, that's a lot of money, but I just don't feel excited. And maybe there's another job in Ames, Iowa, that's paying half that. But when you think about that, and being back maybe closer to your family, or out there in the Midwest and the Great Plains, maybe your heart is like, alive and jumping up and down and going, yeah, yeah, this one. That's the difference. See, where the the, the mind can say, well, obviously you take the job that pays the most in a funky, cool city with lots of arts and good food, but your heart knows what you want. And it's not just like, I like chocolate better than vanilla. It's a kind of want that is good in the long term. It's part of a path. And to get back to your original question about the heart path, the feeling tones are how we navigate day by day, situation by situation, our lives. 
And the cumulative decisions are the heart path. It's simply saying yes over and over to the venue, the direction that your heart, so to speak, this felt sense is inviting you to over and over again. And my work as a counselor, shamanic healer in the fire talks to do is basically helps people get skilled at what this thing is, how to read their own heart, so to speak, and then deal with the inevitable barriers that come up in following the heart path. Because guess what your family is going to say if you say no to the most lucrative job? They're going to think you're crazy or your friends or whatever, your partner, your ex-spouse, you know? And so we deal with the reality of the way we self-sabotage ourselves over and over again and don't follow our hearts. And just to conclude this long explanation, the heart is not just your heart. It's your localized manifestation of the creator in you. That's one of the really beautiful, unique things about shamanic healing is the belief that every living thing has a spirit. Not just like a concept, but like a, it's like, like a sentient awareness. Even stones, right? That's the shamanic part. Rivers, stones, animals, trees. And you can connect with these things. And so humans do too. And if the whole web of life can figure out how to survive in difficult climates, right? <laughs> without iPads and without the internet, how does a sparrow make it through the damn winter? In the north, I have no idea. I couldn't do it. But somehow, without the World Wide Web and a car and climate-controlled environment, these animals don't just survive. They thrive, carry on season after season, just like our indigenous ancestors did. And the way they did that was by following what we're calling here the heart, the spirit in them, moment by moment, no matter what. I hope that helps a little bit with the understanding of the feeling tones, Ryan. Uh, I think that was a great explanation. I was doing the exercise uh, with you as you were talking through it. And yeah, man, when you got to the uh, to the part about envision somebody who you don't like being around, my shoulders immediately tensed up. And mm, yeah, it, yeah, it was very obvious, like what that feeling is, you know, when you really put yourself in that moment. So thanks for doing that. To follow up, though, on what you just said. What's the difference between following your heart and being selfish? Because I think that that would be a common criticism of, you know, somebody who does make a choice for themselves to put themselves on that heart path, that they would be considered selfish by some other people who maybe don't quite understand that. But what's the difference between the two? Oh, beautiful question. Thank you. I'm really liking this interview because you're really getting to, I think, key questions in this work that I don't think get addressed well in a lot of situations. Um, so this is something that I, that surprised me. So when I started doing this work for my own life, before I knew I was going to get into this as a career, so to speak, I was just trying to get happy. Okay. I was struggling. I was stressed. I was depressed. I was anxious. I had too much going on in my life. And I just needed some damn help. And these practices helped like nothing else I had found. And I had found a lot of stuff and I have a lot of education and a lot of skills. And even with that big knapsack of abilities, I couldn't help myself till I ran into this stuff. It was like, oh my God, this is what's been missing. So what I needed was quite simple. It was just someone to kind of say to me, hey, guess what? You know, that intuitive thing in you that kind of knows what it likes and what it doesn't like, you can follow that thing and it'll, it'll, it'll save you. You know, it'll, it'll help you get through these difficult decisions where you don't know how to navigate well enough with just your mind. Because all you have is data there with the mind. And once I started trusting that, I was like, oh, you know, like dope slapped to my forehead with my open palms. Like, oh, oh, that's all I have to do. So for me, it was quite, it wasn't complicated. It was just I needed someone in authority who I trusted to tell me, hey, guess what, Jeff? You've had, it's kind of like, you know, Dorothy's red slippers in The Wizard of Oz. They were with her all along. She just didn't know how to use them. Now. I go into this work as a healer and I assume that that's all I have to do with other people is just help them get clear on their heart. And so I would be doing this with people. And what I learned was a lot of people, especially women, have great difficulty, even resistance to trusting what we're calling the heart. 
I was not expecting this. Again, in my case, all I needed was somebody to say, hey, go for it. You know what you're doing. And yet with a lot of women, I would say we would do work. They would get clear on what they wanted. They were not confused about what their heart was suggesting in their life, but they were terrified of trusting their hearts. In other words, actually taking some action steps, whether it be a shift in a relationship, a job, living situation, moving, whatever. And I learned kind of ignorantly, but slowly from the women who were my clients who were patient enough with me. There's deep, deep cultural woundedness, of course. And this is the whole Me Too movement, frankly, of a culture that's disempowered women from knowing what they want, women own innate wisdom. And it's striking to me as a man that a lot of these so-called indigenous traditions were matrilineal. In other words, the deciders in the culture, for example, the Lakota, the Oglala Lakota people is a matrilineal culture. The deciders and big decisions were not the men, not the warriors, not the war chiefs. It was the women, the grandmothers. And so that's quite different now in our Western culture, right? Women are having to fight back tooth and nail to get back that authority that they've had all along. And what happened was, near as I can tell, is it's been sort of uh, religioned out of them. And the way this came up to me in one of my fire talk sessions one night, I'll never forget this. I was talking to this woman who'd been through a divorce. She was having a difficult time. She had just broken up from a, uh, an affair she had had, and she was feeling terrible. And yet she knew what she wanted. She knew what would help her heal. And I basically was saying, well, follow your heart. And she looked up at me. and She said something like, but Jeff, the heart of man is wicked and cannot be trusted. Who can know it? Deuteronomy 12, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. It was some quote from the Old Testament. Well, let me tell you, I've been in Christian ministry for 20 years, and that was not a big part of my training, that Old Testament kind of negative quote about the human heart, which was taken out of context, by the way. But in her religious tradition, she came a very came from a very strict, conservative, Christian, small church, and it was all about authority, authority of the pastor, authority of God, and sort of the worm nature, you know, of the human being and our sinful nature. And she basically had it beat out of her from childhood on. But the last thing she or any human being should ever do is listen to their heart or trust that. And so thank you for the question, because I want to make a big distinction between the human heart, what I'm calling the heart in the shamanic work, and fleeting emotions, fleeting hormones, impulses, all of that stuff right? That can get you in trouble for sure. Have too much to drink. Oh my God, I fall in love in the dim lit bar and you wake up in the morning like, oh my God, what have I done with this person? We're not talking about that. That's not the heart. That's hormones, right? That's physical impulses. What we're talking about is the soul, the sacred self that is tied up with the human body and expresses itself through the body. And a lot of my work is basically helping people get dif- get clear on the difference, right? So that you can trust this thing. It is an important issue. I'm glad you raise it. And you don't wander into this work unaware. A lot of the practices in my book and the work I do with people is helping you get a sense of the difference. And ultimately, it's not like you get a surefire, you know, telegram from the divine telling you what to do with your life to be happy. We'll still make mistakes. You know, I make mistakes all the time, but there's a reliability over time and a trustworthiness, like a friend, like a well-meaning, wise friend with me all the time in following my heart. And from time to time, I make the wrong decision, but I'm not devastated by that. I don't lose confidence in my entire <laughs> navigational ability. And I just get back on the path because I know how to do that now. So I'll give you a quick example. I live in the inner city of South Bend, Indiana, and for 23 years, The house next to my own house has been a nuisance rental property. Drugs, behaviors, loud music, you know, people coming and going. It's just been a huge annoyance. And I've tried everything in my power, the rational way to solve this, calling the police, calling landlords, talking to the people directly, yada, yada, yada. None of it worked. 23 years, same effed up house next to mine, making me crazy. There was something deep in me that's going, man. I just need to buy that house. Like, what? 
I didn't have the money to buy the house. I did not want to become a homeowner of a whole nother property. I didn't want to become a landlord. So, you know, I'm fighting this the whole way. But the more time went on, this little voice in me kept coming up, just get the house. And my intellect is like, why? What am I going to do with it? I can't make any money on that. The resale value would be terrible. And yet deeper than that, deeper than my rational consciousness, that's all worried about the dollars and the economic resale value is a deep wisdom that said, I know, I know, just do it. Long story short, I bought the house about four weeks ago. And man, <laughs> this is the smartest oh, thing wow. I've ever done in my life. I've been wow. resisting this for 23 years. And I bought the house and it's a mess. It's a pigsty. But instantly, overnight, of course, the nuisance behavior stopped because I was able to evict these most recent tenants. I found a little housewarming gift in the drop ceiling above the tub. They left for me, which was a full clip of semi-automatic 40 caliber long rifle ammunition. Oh. which confirmed for me, these weren't just Boy Scouts in there, you know, smoking a little weed with their friends. They had a full scale, serious drug operation going on right next to my house. And that was a damage to our entire neighborhood. And so I had to make a big financial sacrifice. I still don't want to be a landlord. I'm doing a lot of work on the house. And I frankly don't know what I'm going to do with it, whether I'm going to sell it or rent it. But it's like, it doesn't matter because I did what needed to be done. Something bigger than me for the community. And it brought some instant relief. And now I've got time and some control. You know, I, I think, I hope some healing for the neighborhood and this cycle of, of nuisance properties and tenants over the years. Man, that's beautiful. And uh, quite a housewarming gift for sure. So you did mention something there. You did did mention something there. You mentioned resisting or resistance in that, that answer. And it's actually my next question because you asked a question in the book, what happens when you start making actual changes and moving forward in your life? And then you answered that same question with one word, resistance. And that can come from a few different sources, you know, friends, family, yourself too. So what sort of advice would you have to help us better handle this resistance when we encounter it? Yeah, thank you. This, Yeah, this is, again, one of those things that I wasn't really fully prepared for because I thought all I had to do was help people get clear in their heart, develop a vision, so to speak, is what we call this in the indigenous division questing, the clarity on what their heart wants. And then, you know, you're off and going. It's like, oh, now I got the roadmap. I just need to start driving. But what happens is when you start driving, barriers come up. And that's the resistance, certainly from other people. I mean, you know, if you've ever tried to make a serious change in your own life instantly, you're going to hear about it from your friends, family members concerned about, you know, are you crazy? Are you sure about this? Is this smart? Maybe downright negative resistance from others. And that's difficult. And that is real. And that is no game. That is difficult. And that's why a lot of this work is often referred to as the path of the warrior, you know? Because you got to be a fighter for your heart because no one else on this planet is their job to follow your heart path. And so you have zero people who are as invested and have as much at stake as you do in following your heart. You simply are not going to get a lot of people standing around in a circle applauding you and going, God darn it, Ryan, it is so great you're following your heart. No, it's going to freak out people. Anytime we make a serious change in our life, it rocks the boat. In a domesticated culture that we're in, that most of the time is living asleep. We live our lives based on a couple key principles that we don't think about, but that are very real and also no game. And those principles involve security and safety, financially, emotionally. And if your only goal in life is to stay secure and safe and not take risks emotionally, financially, personally, you're never going to leave the house, so to speak. You're going to keep the same stupid job year after year because at least it's a paycheck. You're going to put up with the same stuff from your coworkers, your boss. You're going to stay in the same relationships. And nothing's going to change because you're frightened of what might happen. And, you know, we don't know what's going to happen when we make change. So the resistance from others, people pick up on that. And it, it, it shakes their reality. It, it interferes with their stability when you start making changes in your life. Now, the more difficult one, though, is self-sabotage. It's bad enough, the resistance we get from other people and just kind of needing to do what we need to do. But much worse, of course, are the voices inside us, the negativity, the judgments. Oh, I could never do that. This book that we're talking about that I wrote, The Lost Heart of Heart Navigation. 
oh my God, you know, all the voices in me, I'm sitting down like, I've never written a book. How can I write a book? There's a ton of books out there on shamanic healing already by people much better well-known and trained than I am, like Sandra Ingerman and Dr. Smith and so on, Michael Harner. Who am I to write, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm surprised I even started writing the thing. But fortunately, I had the tools and kept grinding ahead, but every step of the way. Yeah, Jeff, is this a good use of my time? I had to take time away from work. I saw fewer clients and the time it took for me to actually sit down and do the writing for a year. So just one example there of, of the endless ways we talk ourselves out of or scare ourselves out of making needed change in our lives. And that's the resistance. And I guess the point is, is not to be surprised. Expect it, I say in the book, expect it. And the fact that you're worried or not sure how things are going to work out when you're trying to change your life in a good way doesn't mean there's anything wrong. And that is a radical idea in our culture because we're taught that if we're upset or unhappy or worried, there is something wrong and it's usually somebody else's fault. So go get a lawyer and get some money. But in the, in the hard path, you have to, it's like you set course out at sea in your ship of your life. And guess what? It's not always going to be sunny and winds at your back. There's going to be storms, wind at your face. Sometimes that boat's going to flip and you're going to be underwater and come back up and you've got a mess in your hands. And the fact that that happens doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It just means you're at sea. It's the nature of the journey. And a skilled sailor, following this metaphor, doesn't freak out and go back to port when they run into a storm. They just know what to do. They go, okay, here comes a storm, batting down the hatches, etc. Keep our heads down, drop the sails. Here's how we survive. And this will end. And then when the winds will come back, and we'll know what to do. So the hard path is a lot like that. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a uh, bed of roses. In fact, there are periods of great loneliness in this path because it is like a journey. You're leaving the stagnant harbors of your life and setting sail on a path that only you have a track on. The good news is that when you're out there on the journey, you meet really, really cool people other adventurers, other sailors, so to speak, who have left the port, you know, of their own origins and are on journeys as well. People you didn't even know existed back in the safe, stagnant harbors back home. So expect the resistance. The fact that you feel it or get it from other people is not a clue that you're doing anything wrong. It just means that you've scared some people with your freedom and your liberation from, from the domesticated trance that uh, that we're all in in this culture, following the authority of other people all the time instead of our own. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know what to say in response to that, Jeff. That's <laughs> You're hitting me in my feels, as they say on the streets these days on social media. <laughs> oh, <good>. So uh, <laughs> for sure. Well, Jeff, you are not really that far from me. And I think 2019 may be a good time for me to get over to South Bend and maybe do oh, some, that'd be great. some some in-person journeying here for sure. A quick so, word about that, Ryan, for your listeners. Sure. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful and ideal when I can meet people face to face. If they're in the region, they can drive. But I also do this work online now through Zoom, similar to Skype if people haven't done Zoom. And so we can have a, a fairly powerful shamanic work face-to-face, -face, but using our modern technology and so on. And it works surprisingly well, better than I would have thought. I even experienced personally a soul retrieval session for myself by a really skilled uh, uh, person living in uh, Washington State. And to be honest, I wasn't thinking much was going to happen. And it was one of the most powerful ceremonies I've experienced personally. So this stuff can work even online. Well, tell people where they can find your work online, Jeff, if they'd like to keep up with you or get in touch with you, and also where they can find your book if they're interested. Yeah, thanks. I have a, a nice website I put a lot of work into. It's uh, greatplainsguide.net.com will also work. That's greatplainsguide.net or .com. Um, links there to my book and all my programs and, and what fire talks are. I recorded in a number of short videos that are kind of fun explain more about my work in general, what a fire talk is, how it works, what the cost is. The book, you can also find The Lost Art of Heart Navigation, a modern shaman's field manual published by Bear and Company. It's available on amazon.com and in any bookstore near you. So 
Thanks for that opportunity to plug my book. No problem, man. And thank you for the opportunity to chat with you. I know it's a busy time of year for everybody. So the fact that you can make as much time as you did means quite a lot to me. So thanks for that, Jeff. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for your interest. Enjoyed talking to you. And I look forward to meeting you sometime. And there you have it. My thanks again to Jeff Nixa. What a pleasant dude he is. Loved chatting with him. Loved his demeanor. Loved his book. I loved it so much that I'm giving away a copy of it this month. If you're on Patreon, you're already entered into that giveaway. If you're not on Patreon and you're interested in a chance to win a copy of this book, The Lost Art of Heart Navigation, send me an email, oculture at protonmail.com. Please include your name and address. And I think anyone would benefit from perusing this book, but hopefully the chat here with Jeff was sufficient. We touched on a lot of key areas of his work. And the one thing that stood out to me the most was how, you know, I personally am still not quite on the heart path. I think I'm closer than I've ever been, and this podcast is part of the journey to that path. It might not always be, and I have to be realistic about that, but this has definitely helped me get to a point where I can at least recognize where I am and why I'm there, and how much further I still have left to go. But sharing conversations like this, you know, conversations that I find inspiring and empowering and frankly just beautiful and as I said in the intro, poetic in a way, you know, sharing conversations like this is part of me coming into better alignment with what I feel like I'm here to do. And that's use this platform as a vehicle for personal introspection and maturation and growth and change. And we can rap about anything that you're intellectually curious about or anything that you find socially or culturally or even politically provocative. And we can discuss the ideas and clamor for change on a macro level. But that's not how this thing works. And I'm surprised there's still such a large group of people out there who complain about what's going on in the world or what they think is going on in the world, yet refuse to change anything about themselves and their internal day-to-day -day experience. Because that's where the real revolution takes place. It's not televised. Fuck no, it's not televised. And it may seem like I harp on this a bit too much, and I probably do. But I only share this because of my own experiences. I could spend a lifetime trying to understand the actions of others, why what I see happening out there is the way it is, but if I have not spent any time trying to understand why I am the way I am, why I think the way I do, why I act the way I do, well, I don't know, that seems like a waste of the experience that I've been given here. So don't waste your experience here. We're all meant to do something great while we're here, and what that means will be different for everyone. What I'm meant to do here is different than what you're meant to do here, but we're all meant to do something. And that's why getting on the heart path is so important, at least to me, because if you're thinking about what it is you're meant to do, you've already failed. Feel your way through this intuitively. Use that tremendous gift that you've been given, your intuition. There's already a shift back toward that, and you can see it at that macro level. It's represented by the further empowerment of women in our culture and in our day-to-day -day lives, and that is beautiful and long overdue. You know, I know I've wronged the feminine side of myself for years, and because of that, I've wronged some of the women in my life along the way, and that is just not a good way to be. But the more I ground myself in that energy, the more I see the relationship with the feminine aspect of myself improve, and the more I see the relationship with women in my life improve. And don't forget Mother Earth here either. That's a crucial component of all this too. You have a patriarchy that has done all they can to not only disempower women individually and societally, but they've done all they can to destroy Mother Earth as well. Toxic and synthetic and genetically modified plants, flowers, crops, water, weather, animals, and us. You name it, it's been fucked up in some way. But the only way to fix that is to create a strong, empowered collective. And the only way to create a strong, empowered collective is to create strong, empowered individuals. And the way you do that, you find whatever it is that's truly missing from your experience here. And you won't have to look far. There's a reason they call it the magic mirror, because it really does give you the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, Jeff and I talked about soul loss, soul extraction, and soul retrieval, dragons and dragon work, how to alleviate self-induced suffering, mindfulness and the body's energy cycles, Toltec wisdom and shamanism, what dreams tell us about the heart path, and guided and unguided shamanic journeying. And a shout out to a slew of new patrons from the last couple weeks who hopefully enjoyed that extension. So my thanks to Amelia, Justin, Chris, Dave, Mukio, Blake, Aaron, Paul, Leia, Orlia, Joan, Francis, and Jen, and a huge thanks to Raymond who became the newest official executive producer of the show. If you want to hop on board the esoteric endeavor here, patreon.com slash occulture is your port of call. And speaking of, I need to sail away for now because the siren that is my bed is calling me back home. So until next time, you've just been initiated into occulture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to 
to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.